Before the flood, life in the early chapters of the Bible was a world apart from what we know today. In the book of Genesis, we step into an age before the great deluge, a time shrouded in interpretations. It's an era of early humanity marked by extraordinary lifespans, divine human interactions, and an intimate connection with God. Characters like Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, and later, Noah, offer us glimpses into a relatable life. Yet, a multitude of factors converge to bring about the catastrophic flood. Satan and the fallen angels played a pivotal role. This saga began long before the world itself came into existence with the creation of the sons of God. In the Bible, within the book of Job, God unveils an event that predates the creation of the world. In Job 38, verses 4 to 7, God inquires, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? It's here we learn of the divine measurements, the fastening of earth's foundations, and the setting of its cornerstone. As morning stars sang in unison, and all the sons of God, the angels, rejoiced, we glimpse the angelic beings who witnessed Earth's creation, celebrating the glory, power, and wisdom of God's work. Now, before the flood introduces a fallen being. The Bible briefly alludes to fallen angels, as the majority in heaven remained faithful. But there were some who made a fateful decision. Heaven was meant to be their eternal home, yet they turned away. Their fallen state underscores the concept of angels possessing free will, a notion made evident in the book of Jude. In Jude 5-6, we are reminded that after saving the people from Egypt, the Lord subsequently destroyed those who did not believe including angels who abandoned their designated place of power and their heavenly dwelling. So, what caused this rebellion? Angels had a specific purpose, to reside in heaven, worship God, and fulfill His commands. Humans were designed to dwell on earth, but angels were meant for heaven. Nevertheless, some angels strayed from their heavenly origins, led by Satan, who masquerades as an angel of light. This marked the Great Rebellion, where Satan and his legion of fallen angels waged war against God and his loyal angels in a bid to overthrow God's authority in the everlasting realm. Jesus himself provides an account of this celestial battle. In John 17 verse 5, Jesus talks about the glory and majesty shared with God the Father before the world's creation, witnessing Satan's fall from heaven like lightning. Satan is not merely a red figure with horns and a pitchfork, he's an ancient being with real spiritual power, which he wields for selfish and evil purposes. As Paul pointed out, we are in a wrestling match, not against flesh and blood. Satan's kingdom is highly organized, with various areas and levels of authority, its headquarters in heavenly regions. This revelation might astonish some, but it's evident throughout the Bible that a spiritual war began, shaping the course of history. This is indeed a clash between two kingdoms. One, ruled by God, the Prince of Peace, and the other by Satan, the Prince of Darkness. After being expelled from heaven, Satan and his followers joined forces to form a rebel kingdom. In the Garden of Eden, Satan launched his first assault on God's authority on earth. He considered earth his domain and viewed Adam and Eve as invaders. God created mankind to inhabit earth, so Satan needed a plan to establish his kingdom. Initially, there was a place called Eden, 
which in Hebrew means joy or happiness. It was a place of communion with God, as mentioned in Genesis 3 verse 8. In this perfect garden, there was a special tree known as the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God instructed Adam and Eve that they could eat from any tree except this one. Satan's first tactic against Eve was sowing doubt, asking, has God indeed said? Genesis 3 verse 1. He used this doubt to make her question whether the consequences of disobedience would truly lead to death, contradicting God's warning, you will not surely die, Genesis 3 verse 4. The final approach Satan used was temptation. Due to their disobedience, Adam and Eve could no longer remain in the Garden of Eden. Satan's counterattack overwhelmed them. However, God established a foothold, promising that the serpent's head would be bruised by the seed of the woman. He displayed his mastery over Satan before banishing Adam and Eve from the garden. The first murder, Cain and Abel, illustrated the consequences of sin. Despite their expulsion from the garden, God continued to bless Adam and Eve, and they had two sons, Cain and Abel. They knew they should make offerings to their Creator. While God accepted Abel's offering, he did not regard Cain's offering. This infuriated Cain, who deceived his brother, murdered him, and disowned him. Am I my brother's keeper? he asked, fearing reprisal. God marked Cain to protect him, declaring vengeance upon anyone who killed him, Genesis 4 verse 15. Cain was sentenced to be a restless wanderer away from his family. He settled in the land of Nod, where he built a city named after his son Enoch. Cain's descendants became influential figures of their time, including Jabal, who lived in tents and raised livestock, Jubal, who played stringed instruments and pipes, and Tubal Cain, a blacksmith who forged tools out of bronze and iron. Genesis 4 verses 17 to 22. Following Cain's punishment, the story shifts to two families. Unfortunately, Cain's violent tendencies were inherited by his descendants. Violence became a source of pride among them, culminating in the great-great-grandson embracing evil. In stark contrast to Cain's line, God established a new family tree. He gave Eve a son named Seth in place of Abel, who continued the same kind of worship as his deceased brother. As people began to invoke the Lord's name in connection with Seth, it became evident that Cain's form of worship, driven by pride, focused on itself. In contrast, the humble way of worship practiced by Abel and Seth reached out to God, Jude 11. Woe to those who follow the path of Cain, rushing for profit akin to Balaam's error, and being destroyed in Korah's rebellion. It's no surprise that when God needed an obedient servant many years later, he chose Noah from Seth's line. Cain's legacy was intricate. On one hand, his family was innovative, coming up with new ideas and ways of doing things. However, they were also prone to conflict and harming others. This duality became a symbol of human nature, a struggle between our potential for great good and our capacity for great evil. In the generations following Adam, the world became both populated and marred by sin. People were unkind, engaging in lies, theft, and even murder. During this era, lifespans were extraordinarily long, numbering in the hundreds of years. It was a different time, a period when humanity remained closely connected to its origins, 
and the world was younger and vibrant. Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters besides Cain and Abel. As their family grew, the foundations of civilization were laid. The Bible tells us, after he became the father of Seth, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Genesis 5 verse 4 Their children married and started their own families, leading to a steadily growing population. Apart from Cain and Abel, Seth was another son of Adam who had descendants, including Enoch, Methuselah, and eventually Noah. Adam, the first man, lived to the astonishing age of 930 years. His son Seth lived for 912 years, and Seth's son Enoch for 905 years. Genesis 5 verses 5 and 8, 11. Through the generations, each man fathered children and passed on their wisdom about farming, animal care, and spiritual connection with God. These people carried the seed of humanity's first union with fallen angels. Despite their long lives and deep wisdom, they were not immune to the challenges that often afflicted mankind, such as jealousy, anger, and at times, violence. However, there was a man named Enoch. In Genesis 5 verse 21, we first encounter him as the father of Methuselah, who later became the oldest living man according to scripture. Enoch, when studied through the Bible's genealogies, is revealed as the great-grandfather of Noah. Genesis 5 verses 22 and 24. The Bible tells us that Enoch walked with God in an era where most of his peers were known only for their births and descendants. Enoch's life was a breath of fresh air in history. Although he didn't live as long as some of the others, his testimony was striking. The Bible states that he walked with God, and when it was time to leave the earth, God took him without the usual passage of death. Enoch's story serves as a template for people throughout different generations, teaching us to live for the audience of one. He silently conveys the importance of seeking a close and intimate communion with God, knowing that in doing so, we can experience God in a profound way. Genesis 5 verse 24 New American Standard Bible. Enoch's case represents the first recorded rapture as God simply took him. The intensity of his fellowship with God was such that God's presence enveloped him and whisked him away. The book of Hebrews talks about the men of whom this world was not worthy. Despite the beauty of Enoch's life, his era was not entirely rosy. People lived long but not always well. They had many years to perfect their skills, build things, and explore the earth, but they also had more time to make mistakes, to stray from God's path, to let their hearts harden. This eventually led to a world so corrupt, so far from its divine origins. With the expansion of population, growth, and the spread of tribes and families, roles and professions began to diversify. People couldn't only be herders and farmers anymore, they needed to diversify. For instance, Cain was a worker of the ground, Genesis 4 verse 2, while his brother Abel was a keeper of sheep. This suggests that even at that early stage, roles were being defined based on need and skill set. Tubal Cain, a descendant of Cain, became an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron, Genesis 4 verse 22. This indicates the emergence of more specialized professions like metalworking. Musicians also made their appearance, Jubal, another descendant of Cain, 
was the father of all who played the harp and flute, Genesis 4 verse 21. These roles allowed society to become more complex and organized, setting the stage for more advanced forms of civilization. However, life before the Great Flood wasn't perfect or happy. The Bible tells us that the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time, Genesis 6 verse 5. In a nutshell, before the flood, humanity expanded and diversified, families turned into tribes, roles turned into professions and civilization took its first steps. As the self-appointed commander of the Kingdom of Darkness, Satan summoned his evil legions to infiltrate humanity with the intent of polluting the endemic line leading to the Messiah. Genesis 6 verses 1 to 2 When human beings began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. In the book of Job, these sons of God are characterized as angels. Two-thirds of the angels stayed with God in the third heaven, elect angels, while one-third were ejected, Satan's fallen angels. God's kingdom was thriving in number and strength, feeling threatened, the Prince of Darkness called upon his evil legions to infiltrate humankind. These fallen angels descended on earth and gave birth to the Nephilim or giants. The Hebrew word for Nephilim translates as fallen. This satanic invasion corrupted the whole world. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. It is more accurate to see the sons of God as either demons, angels in rebellion against God, or uniquely demon-possessed men, and the daughters of men as human women. The wickedness of mankind, Genesis 6 verses 1 to 5, indicates that the earth was not a place of peace or kindness, but one filled with sin, violence, and moral corruption. Imagine a world where people are consumed by their own desires, always seeking to do whatever they want, regardless of the cost to others. Honesty, integrity, and kindness are not virtues that are celebrated or even understood. Instead, deceit and manipulation rule the day. Everyone is out for themselves, and the very fabric of society is torn apart by selfishness and wickedness. In such an environment, families are not sanctuaries of love and support, but rather battlefields of deceit and betrayal. Neighbors don't look out for each other, they look to exploit one another. Governments are not institutions of justice, but rather systems of oppression, upholding the rule of the powerful over the weak. Now, insert into this chaotic world an unusual development, the Nephilim. The Nephilim were special and not like regular people. They were really strong and larger than life, but they seemed to make the world's problems even worse. They were admired, feared, and perhaps even worshipped, pulling people further away from the true God who had created them. Their might made them objects of fascination, but they were part of a world that was spiraling further and further into chaos and sin. In this context, God saw the wickedness of mankind, spiritual and moral decline, and God's grief over humanity, the crown jewel of creation. Humanity, which had lost its way, living in harmony with each other and the world. People were consumed by violence, wickedness, and deceit. God looked down upon his creation and felt an immense sorrow. The Bible says the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, 
and his heart was deeply troubled. Genesis 6 verse 6. It was a divine grief, a sorrow so deep it transcended human understanding. Like a parent heartbroken over the actions of a wayward child, yet infinitely magnified. In his great pain, God made a difficult decision, Genesis 6 verse 7, Amplified Bible, so the Lord said, I will destroy, annihilate mankind, whom I have created, from the surface of the earth. Not only man, but the animals, the crawling things, and the birds of the air, because it deeply grieves me to see mankind's sin and I regret that I have made them. God was upset by the actions of the people he made and was left with no other option to heal a world spiraling into chaos. Noah, a righteous man, stood as a beacon of hope. The world had gone astray, but Noah stood out as a beacon of hope, a man of integrity and faith. These virtues were instilled in his children and his household, which served as a sanctuary of godliness. When God shared his sorrowful decision to wash away the wickedness through a flood, Noah's faith did not waver. He accepted the heavy but resolute task, understanding the gravity of the mission, and prepared for the flood. Despite people around him making fun of him or not believing that something bad was going to happen, Noah, a family man, and a loving father, instilled the same virtues in his children. As the sky broke open and the earth was swallowed by water, Noah's virtues became the cornerstone for a new world. His faithfulness and obedience preserved life. The ark was Noah's family sanctuary, a vessel designed to carry them above the waters that would soon envelop the earth. God provided Noah with very specific dimensions, designs, and plans for the Arkansas. This wasn't a regular boat, it was a special ship designed to save the last living things when the world was flooding. Genesis 6 verses 14 to 16. The ark was to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. When converted to modern-day measurements, it would be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet tall. It had a door and a window, and it was divided into different levels. Noah began the monumental task of constructing the ark, a project that wasn't easy, and many ridiculed him and questioned his sanity. However, Noah had faith, and as the years went by, the wood took shape, and a magnificent ark stood tall as an undeniable testament to Noah's obedience and faithfulness. God also provided Noah with instructions on who and what to bring into the Arkansas Noah was to bring his wife, his sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives aboard. Additionally, God told Noah to bring two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive. He was also instructed to take seven of every clean animal, a male and his female, and two of each animal that was unclean, a male and his female. Furthermore, seven of each kind of birds of the air, male and female, were to be brought into the ark to keep their species alive on the face of the earth, Genesis 7 verses 2 to 3. Noah did everything just as God had commanded him, Genesis 6 verse 22. His unwavering faith and obedience in following God's instructions were crucial in preserving life in the face of the impending flood. This story of Noah and the ark serves as a powerful testament to the enduring power of virtue and faith in the face of overwhelming darkness, and it shows how God's covenant with Noah marked the beginning of a new era for humanity. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends so we can keep making them.
For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.